Bueno, así cogará. E, bueno, es que recasco Torchagati, que donostia co Udala, que está ante el museo, que va a entrar a tu taco y salionetara. Gaur va aquí sué, Susan George, de Google X, neta. Shall I start? It's now me. Well, good evening, everyone. Can you, can you hear? It's okay. I can't see you. We're in a splendid setting, absolutely marvelous church, centuries watching us here, but the only thing wrong with it is that I can't see the audience. And so uh, sometimes I will do this to see if you are still here. Maybe you'll want to leave. And the other thing I want to tell you uh, is that I thank the organizers for bringing me to San Sebastian uh, once more. I've been here before. I was just reminded last time I was here was eight years ago. And this evening I'm not in very good shape. So if I start to cough, don't worry, I'm not going to collapse. Uh, but I can't hear anything. I was on the plane with a bad cold. And if I cough, I'm, I'm not going to collapse, but you just wait until I stop coughing, and then we'll continue. Uh, so this evening, we're going to talk about the TTIP, the treaty that is under negotiation between the United States and the European Union. And this treaty, I believe, is an attack against democracy. It is a treaty which, if it is finished, signed, and ratified, will give enormous power to transnational corporations will take power away from citizens and from their elected representatives and from their governments. And so the reason that I am here is because I want you to know about it so that you can tell other people so that when the time comes, we will have enough citizens informed about this treaty that we can all mobilize and come together and defeat it. And before I give you a lot of bad news, because there will be a good deal of bad news this evening, I want to say that I think that we can defeat this treaty. We don't have to accept it. And the more people know, the more they can fight against it. But the media are not helping us very much. I don't know in Spain, but certainly in France and in other countries where I've spoken, the media do not talk about this treaty. Either they think it's too boring or they think it is too complicated for people to understand, and that's not true. It is not so complicated that you can't understand it but they are not helping us to make it known. And in my experience, as soon as people learn what is in the treaty, they want to have it, they want to get rid of it. There's something in it for every single person here to hate in this treaty. So let's look at what it is. <clears throat> the name is Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, which I'll shorten to TTIP, TTIP. And is it about trade? It's transatlantic, yes, okay. It's a partnership in the sense that it is a collusion between very large corporations from both sides of the Atlantic, and I'll tell you more about that in a moment but the partnership is not between peoples, the people of the United States and of Europe. It's, it's strictly among elites and corporations. The trade, is it about trade? 
Well, only a very little bit, because already most of us think of trade as being a question of selling things across frontiers. And sometimes there are tariffs which you have to pay if you want to sell your goods in another country. And between Europe and the United States, the tariffs are extremely low already. They're averaging two or three percent. So it's not worth having a big fuss, a big uh, complicated uh, negotiation that goes on for years just to get the tariffs at the frontiers down from, say, two percent to one percent or zero. That is, it's not about trade except in one very important area, which is agriculture. And there we do have protections in Europe because, and I think we have properly protections, it's, it's good thing to have protections. Because first of all, American farms are hugely mechanized, hugely capitalized, and with uh, enormous surfaces. There is no way that smaller European farmers can compete in any way with American agriculture, where there may be 60 to 100,000 hectares. Uh, there is no way that we can compete with the industrial production, which for corn and soya, and corn and soya are in nearly every single processed food that you buy at the supermarket, and that corn and soya that comes from the United States is almost certainly full of genetically modified organisms. That is at least 85% of all the corn and the soya beans that are grown in the United States is now GMO food. So that's one reason. The other reason is because our farmers can't compete. And I just saw today through a message on the internet, I was very pleased to see that the new Polish minister for agriculture said Polish farmers cannot compete and we have to protect ourselves. This, if this treaty passes, it would be a very bad thing for Poland. But it would also be a bad thing for France, for Spain, and for other countries because we have many small farmers. In the United States, there's 2.2 million farmers who are feeding the whole of the United States, 300 million people, plus uh, being the biggest agricultural exporter in the world. It gives you an idea of the productivity. And in Europe, we still have about 13.7 million farmers, but I promise you that if this treaty passes, we are going to lose millions of farmers, and what do we do with them? Where do we employ them? What happens when they lose their livelihoods in farming? Don't we already have enough unemployment in Europe without ruining our farmers? And who protects the landscapes? if not the farmers. We have the chance of living, the luck to live in very beautiful countries, and that is largely due to the fact that they have been cultivated for hundreds and hundreds of years. So just because the Americans want to export their corn and soya and many, many other crops to Europe, is not a reason to drop our tariffs, which are now, on average, in agriculture, about 12 to 14 percent. So the treaty is about trade in that sense, about agriculture and, to a lesser degree, about cars. But it isn't otherwise very much about trade. So what's the third letter? Transatlantic Treaty on Trade and Investment. Oh. What's investment? Yes, it's very much about investment. We already have a lot of transatlantic investment, nearly $3 trillion. 
there's more American investment in Europe than there is European investment in the United States, but altogether it comes to about three trillion. I always have trouble with numbers in Spanish. I hope that, that the translators uh, uh, can, can manage this, but I'll just tell you that it's three with 12 zeros. So that's how much investment there is now. And that might be a good idea, except that one of the major clauses of this treaty will certainly be a very particular provision to safeguard investors. Now, this provision has a long history because there are now about 3,200 bilateral treaties, 3,200, 3,200 that have already been signed and that all have this clause. This clause is called the Investor to State Dispute Settlement System, ISDS for short. Investor to State, that means that if a company is not satisfied with the treatment it is getting from a government, or if it is not satisfied when the government wants to pass a new law to protect citizens or <coughs> to protect the environment or whatever, they have a right under these treaties to sue, the company has the right to sue the government, not in a regular court, but in a private tribunal, which is a private tribunal with private lawyers and three private arbitrators. Those ar arbitrators will decide <clears throat> whether the company has uh, a good case, in which case the government has to compensate it or it has to change the law. Here are some examples. Under one treaty that was signed among mostly Europeans, the Sw Swedish company Vattenfall is suing Germany because Germany decided to get rid of its nuclear plants. And Vattenfall is a company that distributes electricity. And so their complaint is that this is going to be harmful to our profits. And the, the, the treaties all have a clause that says that if the company's reasonable expectations are not met, it has a right to sue. If it feels it has been partially expropriated, it has a right to sue. And Vattenfall is demanding 4.8 billion euros from Germany because it decided to phase out nuclear power. You can see how harmful this can be to any country that wants to change its policy. In another treaty, two other treaties, Philip Morris, the cigarette producer, is suing the governments of Uruguay and of Australia because both these governments want to sell cigarettes and tobacco in plain packaging, plain cigarette packets, in gray or brown or some unattractive color, and there would be a tiny logo on it just to say what is the brand of the cigarette, but all of the rest of the package would be health warnings. Maybe they put pictures of diseased lungs on the packet, I don't know. But the company is suing. These cases have not been decided, but they are the, 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 the decisions of the government to have plain packaging for tobacco products is obviously to protect public health. But the, but the company says, no, you are partially expropriating me. I had the right to expect a stable business environment. 
you can see that the clauses are very broad and that allows the company to contest every time a, company, a country <clears throat> decides to make a law which would improve the situation for the population. Another undecided case, the French company Veolia has sued the government of Egypt because Egypt decided to raise the minimum wage. That, I think this, I mean, this is particularly uh, threatening. All working people should worry about that. If, if a country does not even have the right to raise the minimum wage without being sued by corporations, uh, they can do anything. Now, a couple of, com of, com of cases that have been solved, in, in Ecuador, Occidental Petroleum, an American oil company, is, has sued the government of Ecuador, and it had an award, a compensation, of $1.8 billion because Occidental demanded to drill in a particular area. The government said, no, you can't drill there. It's a protected area. And the uh, Occidental took them to an arbitration tribunal. And the tribunal decided that the company was right and they should have been allowed to drill and that it was a reasonable expectation when they invested in Ecuador. So now they, Ecuador has to pay uh, $1.8 billion dollars to Occidental Petroleum, one of the richest uh, corporations on earth. That's just a sample of the cases. We now have about 640 cases under different, uh, uh, different treaties, different bilateral treaties, and if we had an investment treaty between the United States and Europe, there are thousands of companies, thousands, that would gain the right to sue. Already Spain is being sued under another treaty. I'm sorry, I don't know the details, but Spain decided it, it, at one point that it was going to uh, subsidize renewable energy. And then with the budget cuts and austerity, etc. It said we can't afford to subsidize renewable energy. And so the, the renewable energy companies have found that without the subsidies, it's impossible for them to make a profit. And so they are suing. And Spain is being sued. This is a case where it was a good idea to do renewable energy. But if they can't subsidize it, they, you have to have a different government or a different policy, but in any case, you're not going to have renewable energy. But the, the company is allowed to sue, so Spain is probably going to have to pay something in any case. Now, what are the statistics on all of this? Because these trials are expensive. An arbitrator costs 3,000 euros a day, or $3,000, rather. There's three of them, so that's already $9,000 every day. There are battalions of lawyers on both sides. These are very specialized lawyers, <coughs> usually American or British lawyers, and they have, uh, they're very uh, top people, and they earn about $800 to $1,000 an hour. So the costs of these, of these trials, are extremely high, and who pays? You do, I do, taxpayers. We are the ones who pay. Governments don't just have money like that that falls from the sky. And so the costs of these trials can go up to at least $30 million, which is paid partly, usually by the government. And the number of, of cases would increase tremendously if the TTIP were passed because it's not just the new investors who could sue. It's all of the investors who were already there. So all the thousands of investors who have put $3 trillion 
dollars into investments on one side or the other would suddenly have the right to sue. Now, up to now, uh, uh, UNCTAD does the t statistics on this. 320 some cases have been decided. And of those 320, 37% were decided in favor of the state. However, that leaves 63% that were either decided in favor of the corporation or were decided out of court because the, the, the government got sick of having to keep on paying the arbitrators and they decided together that they would just make a settlement. And those cases, we don't know anything about how much was paid or if the law was canceled or not. We, don't, we just don't know because they have no obligation to say that there has been a trial. Uh, but uh, we, the, the number of cases would go up hugely if this treaty is passed. And this is a real danger because it simply bypasses our court system. I mean, we have democratic courts. Now, 40 years ago, when they first started signing these treaties, these bilateral treaties, okay, you could say in some cases that some countries had extremely corrupt court systems, Pakistan, um, many African countries, and you could say we have to have a private system in order to have a just protection for the investor. Fair enough, but you cannot say that about the courts in the United States and Europe. What it is, is a privatization of justice, and you cannot say that Spanish courts would not give reasonable decisions on cases like that, or that for that matter, American courts would not give reasonable decisions. So that's one attack against democracy. The other main thing that I think people have to know about is that regulation, which has been put in place to protect citizens, to protect the environment, to protect labor, to protect our health, uh, and, and to, in general, make sure that you cannot put just any old product on the market, this too is being attacked. The corporations say that they could save billions if they didn't have to follow certain regulations and they say that we have to do duplicate tests here and duplicate tests there and they have a whole argument in favor of getting rid of a lot of regulation but not only that, the companies want to be present when regulation is first mentioned. And they want to be able to get rid of a whole lot of things that have already been decided. Now, how can companies be in such a strong position? Well, they have been working on this for 20 years. The corporations from Europe and the United States first came together 20 years ago 1995 <coughs> in the in an organization called the Transatlantic Business Dialogue. And the Transatlantic Business Dialogue was sponsored on one side by the US Department of Commerce and on the other side by the Trade Directorate of the European Union, but it was the companies that did the talking. And about 70 companies of the among the largest in the world came together and they sorted out exactly what they wanted in a treaty. They did it by groups, they did it by the chemical people, the pharmaceutical people, the vehicle people, uh, the petroleum and gas, energy people, etc., etc., the food people, very important. And they decided together what they wanted. So this is not a question of America versus the United States. And it is not a question of the 
European people or the Spanish people against American citizens. This is bad for all citizens, and our governments have gone along with it. And that is what is, to my mind, disgraceful. And our, these companies have been talking for 20 years. They have made their blueprints. They have written exactly what they want. They are telling the governments what it is they want. And they are the ones that we have to go after. But it's not just yours. It's not just uh, Americans. It's all of them together. There are no disagreements there. And what's more, the lawyers are absolutely overjoyed. They say we're going to have so much business uh, with lawsuits that it's going to be bonanza time. It will be Christmas every day. So the companies know what they want. They have come together in another uh, group. The, the transatlantic business dialogue has evolved over the years, over these 20 years, and now it's called something different. It's called the Transatlantic Economic Council. And I'd just like to read you, if you go to the site of the Transatlantic Economic Council, this is the first thing you will read. They say, the Transatlantic Economic Council is a political body to oversee and accelerate government-to-government -government cooperation with the aim of advancing economic integration between the European Union and the United States of America. Now, this is a very incredible, I think, an incredible statement to put on your website. A political body. These people have never been elected by anybody, but they are sponsored by the governments of both sides. Have any of you ever heard of the Transatlantic Economic Council? Anybody ever hear of it? I was, I mean, I didn't even know the name had been changed in 2007. I'd heard of the Transatlantic Business Dialogue, but I never heard of the Transatlantic Economic Council. And did any of you vote to have a political body which would oversee and accelerate government-to-government -government cooperation? And is your goal to have e economic integration between the European Union and the United States? We never had a debate about that. And they also say that it is extremely po uh, important to empower the private sector. So you see they've got all the infrastructure in place. They have their connections to the government. They have been working on this. They have their officials. They have their lobbies. They don't need us. They don't need citizens. And the last thing they want is citizens to debate whether their program should go through or not. And that is why we know so little about it. And here is the moment when I ask you a question, which is, before you came here this evening, how many people had not heard before of the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership? Have you, did you ever, who had not heard of it? Well, you're a very well-informed audience. I can't see all the hands, but raise, raise your hands high, because this is, this is not to shame anybody. This is for me to know um, how many people in Spain are already informed. Well, that's, that's pretty good. That's pretty good, because uh, that means that the Spanish groups like ATAC, but the, all the other NGOs like Friends of the Earth, it means they've been doing their job and they've been putting this uh, on the agenda. So I'm very happy to, to know that. Okay, what else is wrong with this treaty? Well, uh, I mentioned GMOs. The Americans say that we do not practice genuine science in Europe. Their idea is that unless you can prove that something is harmful, in this case to the human body, you can put it on the market. And they say, we have not proven that 
GMO foods are uh, possibly harmful to the human body. They don't even mention the fact that if we have GMO foods and if we accept them, that means that there are three companies, basically, that have a monopoly on all of the seeds of all of our important crops. But um, they say that we don't practice science and that we should accept uh, these crops and that we have not proven that things are harmful. Now here's a contrast. Over the last 40 years, uh, both sides have developed databases of chemicals. In the United States, it's 83,000 chemicals. I don't know how many it is in Europe, but it's in the thousands. And of those chemicals, Europe has banned 1,200 and said you cannot put these chemicals on the market. You can't sell them and you cannot use them in European made products. During the same period, the United States of 83,000 chemicals has banned five. That's all. The rest, they are free to sell in the United States. And they say we have not proven that these chemicals are harmful. And that includes what are called endocrine disruptors which really play havoc with your hormones and are known to cause breast cancer. So that's just a couple of indications. But the United States corporations do not want what are called geographic indications. In other words, you could make champagne or you could make Rioja, Vino Tinto, in California, and you could call it Rioja. If you don't have a geographic indicator and you don't have that protection, you can make champagne anywhere. And the Americans say, this is now a generic term. Champagne is a perfectly ordinary word. It doesn't have to mean that it is produced in the Champagne region of France. And there are over 3,000 of these indicators. I mean, you have, uh, uh, you, you have uh, Serrano ham, for instance. Uh, we have Charolais beef. Uh, people have cheeses. There's, there's 3,200 of these indicators. And the United States just wants to get rid of all of them. And they say this isn't useful. They don't want labels on food that say what are the percentages of GMOs or what are the percentages of other things. Uh, the, uh, I'll just give you a couple of, of um, questions about food. Um, hormones and antibiotics in beef are authorized in the United States and forbidden in Europe. Um, traceability of meat, knowing where your meat came from, impossible in the United States. Uh, compulsory in Europe. Proportion of, of GMOs allowed in animal feed, 80% in the United States and 5% in Europe. Uh, animal flour, you know, the kind of that's made out of grinding animal bones and then is fed to animals. And we know that that caused mad cow disease. Well, that's still authorized in the United States, and it's fit forbidden in Europe. That's just an example. And then we also have to, have to worry about trade unions, because if you can be sued because you raise the minimum wage, uh, almost anything can happen. The removal of regulation is going to try to attack labor standards. That's for sure. And the United States has not signed Eight, no, sorry, they've only signed two out of eight uh, international labor organization conventions. Conventions about collective bargaining, co conventions about child labor, etc. The U.S. does not sign these. All of Europe and all of other civilized countries have signed 
these conventions of the International Labor Organization. But the United States would start from its law and it would try to get rid of protections of all kinds for workers, saying that these are expensive protections and they are not necessary and there is no reason for American investors in Europe to have to apply these silly laws. Uh, we have to worry also about uh, small and medium enterprises because these enterprises, although Europe is now saying that they would have uh, access to the tribunals, I think the tribunals would be much too expensive for them to use, but also the way they see it, uh, and for instance the Austrians, um, which have come together in their own federation of small and medium enterprises, and they have, have a statement against the TTIP. They say, for example, they know very well because they are usually suppliers to much larger companies. And because they are suppliers, they are dependent on just a few clients. And they say these big companies could very easily go to the United States and invest in the South because half of the states in the United States do not have uh, laws which are favorable to labor. They often forbid collective bargaining. You can do that at the state level in, in the U.S. And so the small and medium enterprises are afraid that they would leave, their big, their big clients would leave, would go to the United States, and would uh, simply leave them behind, and they would not be able to follow. And the big corporations would find suppliers in the United States who would be paid much less because the salaries are also lower in the United States. So there really is something for everybody in this story. There's something against ag agricultural workers and farmers. There's something against workers. There's something against just families who are trying to f feed their children properly. Uh, no matter who you are, uh, you're going to have some kind of attack on your lifestyle and on your, the quality of your life. Two of the what are called offensive interests in the trade negotiations, the Americans are very interested in attacking our health systems and our educational systems because we have generally quite high quality health and educational systems and they want to get some money out of that. One more story and then I will leave the floor to you. The Slovenians, after they were freed from the Soviet influence and the Yugoslav uh, Republic, decided that they were going to privatize their health care. So the government privatized everything and it was a disaster. And 10 years later, everybody wanted to go back. They threw out the government that had privatized health care, and they wanted to go back to their public health system. And they did. However, immediately, two Dutch companies sued them under another treaty because they had decided that the Dutch companies would not be providing uh, health insurance and health care for profit. And I don't know the outcome of those treaty, of those cases yet, but they're probably, the Dutch will probably win. Uh, there have been many, many attacks against the new countries in um, Eastern Europe. Okay, we have, however, we already have one big victory. We have a victory in the sense that the peoples of Europe have come together on this subject. The story is a little bit long. It begins with a few people, including me, who said we have to try to get a citizen's initiative and that people can express 
what they want in a citizen's initiative and, and make the European Commission have a debate about it. So we, sent a, uh, we signed the proper papers and we sent the uh, request to the European Commission, which had been drawn up by German lawyers, and they said this will pass, there's no problems. The Commission refused the question we wanted to ask. So we said, we got together, and the next day we said, we'll do it ourselves, and we will have a self-organized citizens' initiative, but we will do it according to the rules of the European Union. And those rules are that you have one million votes, you have one million signatures on a text, and they must come from seven countries of the European Union, that have met their quota, the quota is fixed by the European Union and it's according to population. In France it's about 55,000, in Spain it's about 45,000, in Germany it's 70,000, etc. But you have to have that many signatures and you have to do it in a year and after a year you either have those signatures or you don't. Well, ours was not official, so the Commission doesn't have to do anything about it. But we got not just a million votes against, or signatures against, and it was also covering the Canadian treaty with, the, with Europe, which I don't have time to go into. And we got 3.2, 260 some thousand votes against. And they came from every country in Europe, west and east, except for the three Baltic countries, Estonia, Latvia, and <clears throat> Lithuania, and Malta, and Cyprus. Everybody else met their quota. You met your quota, everybody did, even Portugal, at the very last moment. So this is a victory, and this means that people are better and better informed. So what I want to ask you tonight is that you consider yourselves ambassadors for this cause, and that you consider yourself, I hope that you feel that you're perhaps better informed than you were when you arrived, and you'll have time to ask questions, and that you uh, are now in a position to explain to other people exactly what this would mean if this treaty is pushed upon us. Because it would affect not just goods, not just pharmaceuticals, not just chemicals, not just food, it would also affect services. And there would be huge attempts to divest us of all of our public services so that corporations could make a profit. And this isn't just Americans, this is Europeans who would also like to get in on this extremely lucrative business. So you are now, I mean, I'm here for one day, and you stay here, and you are now the people in this community who know something that perhaps you didn't know when you came in, and you are in a position to continue to make this public because it's not going to be finished right away. At first they thought they could finish very quickly. Now they said we can finish by 2015, that won't happen. Maybe it won't even happen in 2016, but they're pushing forward. They keep trying to, to, to bring more and more texts together. And if we allow this to go through, and if we think, oh well, you know, it's taking so long that it won't happen, these people are tenacious. They hold on like bulldogs. They didn't get what they wanted about in 1997. They wanted to get the multilateral agreement on investment, which had a lot of the same clauses. They didn't get it. They keep going. They don't get it one way. They will go and try to get it another way. So we have to stay in there and fight until we defeat this thing. And without the public, we can't do it because the European Union wants it, the government of the European Union wants it, they follow the corporations, they are governing in favor of the corporations, 
The American government wants it for the same reasons, and only citizens can fight against that. So I want to thank you for your attention. The floor is yours, and I hope that you will feel empowered, that you can now talk about this to other people and inform them. Thanks. <clears throat> Bueno, orain dugu baiti bezala, denbora bat galderak eta komentarioak egiteko. Hori bai mesedez, e, kontutan hartu iso importantea dela mikrofono hartzea, ze bestela itzutzaiek ez dute, ez dute entzungo eta zin izango diote itzuli, e, Susani. Ahora tenemos el turno de preguntas, lo único, por favor, tener en cuenta e intentar hablar con el micrófono, porque si no las traductoras no le van a poder traducir a Susani. Can, can the interpreters say something so I can see if I can understand them? Do you want to say something? No, I want the interpreters to say something to me. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Bu buenas noches. O persona va, está aquí el micrófono. Va y or ves te va a go a cean. Mañana quiero su. Buenas noches. Yes. Sí. Sí, buenas noches. Eh, muchas gracias, Susa, por tu exposición. Una pregunta. Eh, creo también que el tratado contempla una especie de comisión bilateral que, aunque ahora algunas, eh, algunos temas eh, entren por la baja, luego esa comisión tiene potestad para ir cambiándola y, lógicamente, pues favoreciendo los intereses de esas, de esas multinacionales que has dicho. I got the wrong channel. Number three, I think. No, I got the wrong no. channel. What's the number of the channel? I think it's number three. <clears throat> I touched that side. I was trying. Oh, yeah, really. Yes, right. <clears throat> okay. Okay. So there's. Oh no! no my God, this is terrible. Can I can. I hear myself. This is awful. Uh, <laughs> um, it, no, I want to hear the questions directly in, in English, but I, now I, I, I only hear myself. So there's a bilateral commission. I did not hear the question. Ah, okay. Can the, people, can the person who was asking the question please ask it again? I'm sorry. Uh, we've had persona, a slightly technical. Perdón, eh, que tenemos aquí problemas con el audio. La persona que ha preguntado puede volver a repetir, por favor, que no le hemos oído bien. Sí. Buena, buenas noches. Comentaba eh, que creo que también el tratado contempla un comité eh, de seguimiento que tiene una serie de potestades que podrían que aunque ahora el tratado se, se escriba en unos términos eh, flojos o débiles o, o no tan duros como parece, luego eh, esa comisión tiene suficientes potestades para ir adaptándolos a las necesidades que exijan las transnacionales. ¿no? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, you're right. You are right. Uh, it is what they call an evergreen or uh, open agreement or everlasting agreement, which means that once you have brought together enough subjects, what they do is they bo both sides present papers. Then they try to merge those papers to make one paper out of the two. Then the things they don't agree on, they put in brackets. And then they discuss what's in the brackets. And if they decide that, okay, we've got enough things now that, are, that we've, we've got rid of the brackets on enough things, we will sign that. And that will be the treaty. But since it, it is an everlasting agreement or an evergreen, always green, always open ag agreement, in a year or two, if we decide that the uh, brackets uh, on other things can also be got rid of, 
then we will put them in the treaty and they will have exactly the same legal force that the, what we signed two years ago has. So that's very dangerous because maybe you can mobilize for a couple of years and you know, be, be against something that's signed, but you can't stay mobilized and know, I'm not everybody's going to know that they've got together again. This is negotiated in secret. We rely on leaks. Our, our representatives rely on leaks. After the, no, I'm sorry, this is a little long, but this makes me think of various things. The, after the July negotiations this year, the Americans were really furious because there were leaks. So they were, were leaks for, they thought, on the European side and they insisted that the already very stiff precautions against leaks be reinforced. So now our, our representatives cannot, even, even government functionaries, I think even the minister, cannot read the texts unless they go to Brussels or to the United States Embassy to a secure room where they can read the text, but they can't take notes, they can't photocopy. I mean, this is completely mad. Nobody is supposed to, to read it. So uh, we cannot stay mobilized on, we can't know what's in every single paragraph. This is humanly impossible, and we can't get the news out in time. So you're absolutely right. That's another very good reason to kill the thing. <laughs> Next question. Gabon. Eh, Ordun, eh, gobierno batek, empresa baten inversioa apurtzen du, ez da? Edo zapuzten du. Eta empresa horrek, xalek eta jartzen dio gobierno horri. Kontrakoa gertatzen bada, hau da, empresa batek, gobierno baten inversioa apurtzen badu, Zer kertatzen da, gobernuak ordun salaketa jartzen dio gobernuari? Adibide tontun bat emateko. Gobernu batek liburutegi asko egiten ditu, edo liburutegi bat egiten du, eta liburuz betetzen du, enbertxoa egiten du. Eta lako batean e, Amazon enpresa gertzen da, eta gobernuaren enbertxoa apurtzen du. Gobernuak zer egiten du, salaketa jartzen dio enpresari? Eskerrik asko. I think the government would not be able, I mean, all governments have a government printing office. <clears throat> and I don't think that Amazon could complain about that. It's an interesting question. And I'm not a legal person. I'm not a jurist. Um, but possibly Amazon could insist that they also have a right to the distribution of government publications. That might be a possibility. I don't want to say yes or no because I don't, um, it's a legal question and, and I don't feel secure to say yes or no. But it's a very interesting question. They, they, have, they want to be able to compete with anything public except uh, <clears throat> what they call regalian services, which are the police, the judiciary, the army, uh, the clergy, uh, the births and deaths register, uh, they want to be able to, the corporations want to be able to compete with everything else. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for, the, for coming here and, and giving us a general view about the TTIP. Uh, I've known about it, but I would like to you, you've uh, explained us some of the examples uh, about uh, it's a minimum treaty. I I, I understand, uh, and you have uh, given us some examples of uh, minimums that affect uh, mostly the European Union. Uh, is there any example of of some law changes that that uh, 
uh, it's low, lower here in European Union and will change in, uh, in US? Well, a company would be able to sue the Uni a, a French company or a Spanish company that had invested in the United States would be able to sue the American government. They would have to have grounds to do that. But they, they could perfectly well uh, demand that the U.S. government uh, rescind such and such a law. That has happened very often in the case of the United States uh, in NAFTA. The NAFTA is the Canadian United States Mexican agreement, and there have been many suits against the Canadian government. Uh, for example, I suppose they could happen also against the American government. The Canadian government uh, was uh, ordered corporations to remove an additive from gasoline, which was a pollutant, a very dangerous cancer cancer-generating pollutant. And there was one company that produced this, uh, this uh, additive, and they, they made a lawsuit against Canada. It was an American company, and they made a lawsuit against Canada, and, and they won. And, they had, and Canada had to rescind the law, and as far as I know, they're still using the additive. So it's perfectly uh, possible that the American EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, for example, could push a law through that would be voted by the Congress and could be struck down in an arbitration tribunal. That is a possibility. I mean, anything is a possibility, but the U.S. has had many fewer lawsuits than any other. Usually, they are the ones that attack. <clears throat> Usted ha dicho muy bien, usted ha dicho muy bien que el gobierno de Estados Unidos trabaja para las grandes empresas y la Comisión Europea uh -huh. hace lo mismo. Y también ha dicho que los uh -huh. únicos que podemos hacer algo somos los perjudicados y las perjudicadas, que somos nosotros. Uh -huh. Y ha dicho que lo que uh -huh. contemos a nuestros amigos y amigas. Eh, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Con eso estoy totalmente de acuerdo. Pero yo creo que esos gobiernos eh, se pasan por el forro lo que voten tres millones y medio, aunque sea muy, muy bonito que hayamos votado en contra, pero es da lo mismo exactamente. Entonces, mi pregunta es, eh, ¿qué pasos legales quedan para que se salgan con la suya? Es decir, ¿qué falta de firmas secretas y de ratificaciones y de votaciones de plenos de parlamentos. Gracias. They, they, have to, um, they have to sign the treaty, and then it has to be ratified. And we don't know yet if it has to be ratified just by the European Parliament or if every state will get a chance to ratify. And we don't know that because the European Union has uh, by the Lisbon Treaty of 2007, one of the bad things we got with this Lisbon Treaty it was to have uh, the competence of the Commission decided to be a single competence in the area of trade. It used to be that all the countries were present in trade negotiations. At the time of the WTO, when that was being negotiated, France was there, Spain was there, all the countries of Europe were, were present. That's not true now. Europe negotiates for everybody. And it is Europe that wrote the mandate. And then all the governments in this case signed the mandate. That's an interesting story too. I'll make a parenthesis here. Um, every government in the European Union signed a mandate and gave that mandate to the nego negotiators in the commission. And the mandate said, we want to talk about all, you know, A, B, C, D, a long, long list of things. 
The mandate is now public because they made it public. Everybody had a copy anyway through a leak. So you can read the mandate if you want. However, who wrote that mandate? I wrote to the, to the commission to ask them who was, uh, they, they said it's a high level working group that wrote the mandate. So I asked who was a member of the high level working group. And they sent me back a very polite answer that said, uh, we don't have a list of the people who were in the high level working group. So I don't know who wrote the mandate, but probably their lawyers and so on, uh, you know. Um, so legally, we have to wait for the moment of ratification. And that may be the European Parliament alone if it's decided that the treaty is only about trade and that we can leave it to the committee because it's a single European competence and there are no competences of the, of the member states included. I think it would be pretty easy to prove that this, the member states also have competences because this treaty is about everything. But that will be difficult because the Commission obviously doesn't want to give us a chance to, to ratify because that would mean campaigns everywhere and that very, very easily they might lose. You know, so um, they, they certainly don't want to allow that, but that remains to be seen. So legally what we can do now really is very little. We can only keep putting pressure because they feel that pressure. Don't feel that this doesn't, don't think this doesn't do anything because it does. It, for example, our new trade commissioner is a Swedish woman called Cecilia Malmström. And she got so much pressure on the ISDS, on the tribunal, private tribunal system, that she fixed up a new thing which is about the same. It isn't, you know, it's, it's nothing that would change the fundamentals, but it's called the investment court system. And the investment court system would give at least the right of appeal, but it would still be a private tribunal. It would still be judges who are paid by fee. They would get a small salary to stay on a list of possible judges but all the judges, the possible judges, there'd be 50 of them, and it would still be the commission that chose all the judges. So, I mean, it comes to exactly the same sort of biased uh, instrument. But as soon as they published that, the Americans said, no, we don't want it, and uh, now they're discussing it, and the Americans say they might apparently accept that there be an appeal process, so that if, if the state loses the first time, they can go back to court and have another another try, but paying for it, of course, paying the same large amounts of money. So um, the, 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 the legality of it is, is sort of made up as they go along because they feel that pressure and they're, they're frightened of, of, uh, of, what, of what we reveal. They thought they could make it secret. They thought it could go through, through the, you know, like a letter in the post office but they really feel the pressure. And our minister, um, our French trade minister, uh, said, we're not necessarily going to sign this. And he wouldn't say that unless the government had authorized him to do it. And it was published in a newspaper. But all he said was that the Americans are not proposing seriously, uh, they're not making serious propositions. So, that would be the reason they didn't sign, not because there was public pressure. But he wanted to get the headline, obviously, that we, we may not sign this. Because he feels, I mean, he knows that, that, that everybody in, in, in France who, who thinks, except for the corporations and the very top uh, of the elite, are, are against this thing. Hello, just uh, one question related to what uh, the person has asked before. 
uh, the power of the European Parliament in case they have to, to mm -hmm. ratify the treaty. Mm -hmm. And considering how important uh, this treaty is and the consequences of the treaty, are the political parties considering this treaty into, in their programs? And have they made it public, which is the position in front of this treaty? Um, so far, the EPP technology mixed up here. Um, the EPP, the European People's Party, is for it. The socialists, there is a very interesting question. Uh, they are trying to play both sides of the street. Sigmar Gabriel of the Germans, the German socialists are the most important part of the socialist group uh, in the European Parliament. And they are trying to fudge it so that they can say yes if they do this, if they do that. They thought the idea of the European court system that Malmström proposed was okay. And they, um, they approved, in general, they approved it. But they're not in a good position for that in Germany because their voters, the, the sorts of people who vote for the socialists, are more and more against this and, and including small businesses. They don't, they don't have the same force as the Austrian Federation which has really come out and said, no, we don't want this. But the German Federation is also extremely worried about this. So the socialists are in trouble. Everything to the left, the Greens and the, and the GUE, the, the United Left and the and the Swedish Green uh, faction or, or groups are, um, are against it, and the far right is also against it. I don't know about the ALDE, the sort of liberal centrists. They, I don't think they've made much noise. But, I mean, we have to go after the parliamentarians also, which is something we do. Entiendo que su conferencia fundamentalmente lo que trata es de emponderarnos eh, informativamente eh, a la ciudadanía europea, a la ciudadanía global, para que defendamos nuestros derechos. Eh, secretos, mentiras, ocultación de datos, datos de fuste. Y esto ocurre en la era de la, de la información. Hemos tenido que buscar la información, hemos tenido que leer su informe Lugano hace unos años, hemos tenido que leer a Eduardo Galeano, hemos tenido que leer a Chomsky. Difícilmente a veces encontramos en los medios, en nuestros medios de comunicación, usted ha preguntado qué papel están jugando en el TTIP aquí en Euskadi o en el Estado español. Sabe perfectamente que el New York Times ha publicado recientemente que los medios españoles están en su mayoría en manos de la banca y de los políticos que están en el poder. Ha dicho, cuanto más se sabe, más querremos saber, lo ha dicho aquí. Pero es que cuanto menos nos dejan saber, igualmente, más queremos saber. Wikileaks, hay que buscar la información en muchos campos, en fin, entiendo que estamos en una era en la que la ciudadanía está bastante narcotizada por los grandes medios de comunicación. Mi pregunta, después de decir, hacer esta reflexión, de alguna manera ya lo ha apuntado, pero ¿cómo se puede parar todo esto? Y no solo me refiero al tratado, que sí, sino a ese modelo impuesto desde las élites todopoderosas que va más allá del TTIP, que creo que es un síntoma también de todo esto, porque entiendo que se puede parar. No, señorita George. Señora George. That is a very important question, and I don't have an answer. There are, unfortunately, the neoliberal system has been put in place over a period of 40 or 50 years, and it is struggling now a little more, but it is still there, and it is still influencing the governments. The governments are practicing austerity, which we know very well cannot work. Uh, even the IMF says that austerity will not work now. Uh, we know that the whole system which is run in favor of elites 
is never going to improve the conditions of, of ordinary working people. Um, I have published recently, um, and it's appeared in Spanish, uh, a book which is called Los Usurpadores. Um, it's published by Icaria, which is my usual publisher. Um, and it's about the transnational corporations and the lobbies. And, and there's a long chapter about the TTIP. But that is only one facet. You're quite right. The transnational corporations are important in, in this scheme of, of uh, power to the elites, the banks and the companies, uh, but they're not the only part of it. And, and I think that, um, that knowledge, yes, it, it, I think knowledge is a tool and can be a weapon. And that is why I, I use part of my life to go around and try to inform people uh, because many years ago, when I started off, um, it was easy enough to say, U.S. get out of Vietnam, and people understood you, and they didn't have to have a, a half an hour or th hour long talk. They knew what you were talking about. They might disagree, but at least they knew what it was about. And when we said stop apartheid, that was understood. And now it's not true. I mean, you really have to have knowledge. You have to build up your knowledge or you cannot be effective. And, and the complication of politics is what puts many people off. So I also try to be as clear and as, as simple as possible. Um, and, and the book called Los, Los Usurpadores, uh, published by Icaria, would help you on at least one aspect. It's the, it's the transnationals and it's the, T, it's the TTIP. Um, otherwise, join an organization. Don't try to do things alone. I mean, there's some things we can do alone. We can cut back on our energy use. There are things that people can do by themselves. But, and, and there are also times in life when you cannot join an organization because you don't have time or you have small children or, you know, there's, there, we, we live longer lives now. So there are moments in our lives when we can join an organization. There are a great many people here tonight um, who found the time to spend an evening uh, coming to, to learn something about these questions. And that is very uh, encouraging. I mean, look, you, you encourage me. Uh, because it shows that you that you want to do something, and that so come together in any way that you can. Come together on the climate. Uh, we've got problems now in France because we can't do the demonstrations <coughs> that we wanted to do, uh, and and we need people to march elsewhere. We need people to march on the 29th to to defend the climate because we can't be more than five people in a group. We'll find other ways to, to protest. And we are finding other ways, but, but marching is not one of them. Because we, you know, it's forbidden. And the police would just stop the, the people in the first row and then the second row and so on. So, um, knowledge is a weapon. You start with that and you're here. And so that's why I am encouraged because you start with knowledge and now you have a weapon. Not the only one, but one of them. Bueno, en primer lugar, muy agradecido por su explicación. Uh, se me ocurre preguntar una cosa que no me ha quedado suficientemente clara. Eh, hasta ahora hemos hablado de las repercusiones eh, que se podrán producir en los campos comerciales eh, los, y en los servicios. Eh, ¿Qué intuye usted que puede pasar en el tema financiero? Si se va a liberalizar o neoliberalizar mucho más el tema del campo financiero, ¿qué es lo que intuye usted que puede pasar en este sentido? Gracias. Mm -hmm. yeah. That is one of the few... Thank you for that question. That's one of the few areas 
in which the Americans have better regulations than we do. And the European banks uh, do not want to be regulated, and usually our governments just lie down and, and like dogs and do whatever the banks want in Europe. And the Americans are slightly better. So um, that is one area where we should um, make sure that the regulations, but I don't want to get them through the TAFTA, through the, the TTIP. I don't want to get regulations on banking through that. But yes, it would affect banking, and it would give even more freedom to banks, including the freedom to sue, like any other investor. Galera Gayago, by Emena Orrean. What time do you want to stop? Ten minutes. Aparte de las consecuencias que que este tratado pueda provocar en no solamente en Europa y la bueno no solamente para la población europea y y americana, eh, ¿qué consecuencias creo que cree usted que, que dará a, la, a los países del sur en ese sentido? Y segunda pregunta ah. sería eh, si cree que la, eh, la presencia de China como últimamente una de las potencias mundiales, bueno, económicas mundiales, eh, cree que podría presionar de alguna manera para que ese, ese tratado, porque de, de algún modo le, no le beneficia, ¿cree que las grandes inversiones en, 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 de China aquí en Europa puedan influir para que no, no se lleve a cabo ese tratado? Muy buenas preguntas, de nuevo. Están todos muy smart. Todas las preguntas son extremely interesantes. Um, Geopolíticamente, esto es también un desastre. Look at it this way. Here you have the United States in the middle. On this side, they've got the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is a treaty between the United States and 12, no, 11 Asian countries, including Japan, Australia, the eastern coast of the, the western coast of Latin America, Vietnam, uh, Mexico, Canada's in it again, etc. So that's a very powerful treaty. And then on this side, the, if they had the TTIP, they would have, the United States would be in the middle of about three quarters of world trade and about two thirds of world GDP. You can see how much power that would give to the country in the middle of this system. And this is an agreement which is designed against China first, but the other BRICs, Brazil, China, India, and so on, uh, it's designed against them. I'm sorry, I'm really not in good shape. <coughs> I can cover the microphone. Not me. I'm sorry. I maybe have to whisper. Um, this can be used against these countries to say, look, you better do exactly the same things that we have done and accept exactly the same regulations and rules, because if you don't, you will be more and more cut out of world trade. That's what it's about. Hillary Clinton called the European, called the TTIP, she called it an economic uh, NATO. And she's right. So geopolitically, it would be very hard on the southern countries, particularly the largest ones, and it would also hurt the smaller ones, <coughs> 
which would have to follow a certain number of rules also if they wanted to continue to export to the US and to Europe. So that's, it's an important aspect. My institute, TNI, has published um, a brochure about the impact on the southern countries. No, okay. eh, hola, gracias. Eh, buenas. Eh, quería preguntarle sobre los blindajes. Estoy aquí. <risa> hola. Sí. No, quería preguntarle sobre los, los blindajes que llevan estos tratados para que una vez que son aprobados de forma poco democrática, luego los gobiernos correspondientes no puedan no puedan romperlos. Gracias. In every treaty, there's always a clause that says if you want to denounce the treaty, you can do so, but you have to remain in it for X years. Uh, I don't know what would be the what would be the rule in the TAFTA? As far as we know, they haven't got to that yet, but there certainly would be some rules. So, for example, Italy right now wants to get out of the uh, energy agreement, the energy charter, which is the agreement under which the Swedish company is suing Germany <coughs> for abandoning its nuclear plans, and Italy wants to get out of that and I think they have to stay for seven more years or something like that. So um, it, when you sign it, you're signing away your life, uh, basically. You, you, can, you can get out, uh, but people sometimes ask, yeah, but what if I don't want to pay? What if, what if the tribunal, the private tribunal, uh, decides against me and, and uh, I don't want to pay? I, uh, the government, I don't want to pay the, the, this corporation. Well, um, what happens is that then uh, any state that is a party to the treaty can, can um, commandeer your exports. They can just take them and <coughs> not pay you. So there are sanctions. You know, you can't, you can't this is not a free lunch. <coughs> so ex Ecuador, if it said we're not going to pay, Ecuador's bananas, I think, would have a very hard time getting into the United States. There would be embargoes on those, you know. So it's, it's not a game. Look, if, no, if there are not any dire and pressing questions, um, I'm, I really, um, you know, I'm sort of running out of steam to talk so uh, if if it's i mean if there are dire and really important and burning questions raise your hand and then we'll have one or two maximum more <clears throat> So you got my point. Thank you very much. 